Welcome to Five Dubs by MDDC Press. I'm your host, Rebecca Snyder, the Executive Director of the Maryland, Delaware, and DC Press Association, which represents news media in our region. Five Dubs focuses on the who, what, when, where, and why of local news media. We'll talk with the journalists about the stories behind the news. You can find more information about our guests in the show notes or on our website, www.5-dubs.com. Welcome, everyone. I'm Rebecca Snyder, Executive Director of the Maryland Delaware DC Press Association and host of Five Dubs. Uh, today in the studio, we have the CEO of El Tiempo Latino, uh, Marcos Martin, who has assumed this role just in November of 2022, um, but has a long uh, experience and career in the news media as he's a second generation um, leader of his organization. So welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Rebecca. <laughs> So I wanted to start just to kind of contextualize El Tiempo Latino, um, because you are uh, focused in, in your print publication in D.C., but you go to a variety of ways. And of course, you're you're online and, and digital. So tell us a little bit about the publication and, and the organization. Of course. Yeah, I think it's it's important to to have a little bit of history of El Tiempo Latino uh, because it's a it's a publication that got founded in a, in a 1991. So it's a, I think I believe that 33 years old or soon to be 33 years old publication um, based here in DC, covering Northern Virginia, DC, and mainly uh, Montgomery County and PG County from the print perspective. So we definitely are part of the culture of the of, of the Latinos, Spanish speaking Latinos here uh, in the area. Um, the El Tiempo Latino was acquired by the Washington Post uh, a little bit uh, later uh, in 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 his history, and then in uh, 2017, my family acquired El Tiempo Latino from the Washington Post when. Uh, and was all the transaction with Jess Bezos and, and he purchased that post. So at the end, um, I think for, for, a, for a good um, uh, future of El Tiempo Latino, it got in the hands of a Latino family and we're Absolutely. a minority-owned uh, media company. So that's a little bit of the, of the history of El Tiempo Latino. And uh, we still uh, print and cover those exact areas. I think from the print perspective, we, we could have around... Um, 70,000 readers uh, mm. in that um in, in those parts of the of the DMB uh, but we're definitely pushing a lot of our our digital presence uh, and we consider ourselves at least since 2 years uh, ago uh, a national uh, news outlet because we're reaching right now between 8 and 9 million Latinos across the US that's incredible. And and you had said before we started recording, you had said that you have a publication in Boston as well. So you know, anchored in DC and Boston, that's um you're you're poised to take over the whole East Coast. Yeah, uh, definitely I um our our Boston publication, El Planeta, is uh kind of also the the in in some way the heart of the family because is the we founded El Planeta uh, in in Boston and we acquired El Tiempo Latino but definitely for uh, to, to to talk a little bit of, talk a little bit about the strategy uh, the Boston publication is its ambition is being a local media outlet so mm -hmm. we serve the local community of of, of Boston Revere and the Boston Metro mainly but the El Tiempo Latino uh, strongly protects his local presence but uh, we want to push, and we are successfully in right now pushing El Tiempo Latino brand at a national level that we're not mm -hmm. doing with El Planeta that has the mm -hmm. ambition to be local. Uh, mainly because uh, DC is a, is a great place to, to, to communicate uh, a lot of important stuff for, for Latinos nationwide. Right. Well, when you're talking about policy and legislation, I mean, it's all happen at the federal level. DC is a natural exactly. stepping stone. And I think you've seen that in other um, publications like the Washington Post. It's Correct. not exactly all, it, it, you know, it's covers local issues, but it very much is seeking a national presence. And it makes sense Correct. to to use your geography. Um, now, Correct. I'm curious because, you know, moving from the Washington Post to um, local ownership uh, mm -hmm. and and also 
uh, Latino ownership, how does that kind of inform your approach to the, to the news media, to the coverage, to to the organization as a whole? Yeah, I think it's definitely um, is a change, and I think it's a change for good because uh, you see a lot of push um, around twenty years or seventy years ago, where a lot of uh, big companies or big corporation that own media business start acquiring um, Hispanic media, mm -hmm. and then. Um, a few years ago, start or selling or eliminating or, or closing the business. And we're seeing that across the, the nation. And I think it's mainly is because um, it wasn't um, a big part of their bottom line. Mm -hmm. And if they have to reallocate resources or, or if, if they hit a little bit of a rough, a rough, rough path, uh, or anything that affects the margins, they start to try to eliminate costs. And definitely the Hispanic, uh, you know, brand within a big corporation then represents five, seven percent of their of their bottom line, or or even uh, less than that. But requires a full editorial team. Uh, requires right. sometimes a sales staff that recognize and understand the Latino market, and sometimes they want to. Uh, um, do just one sales department that sells all and think that Hispanic inventory is the same as a mass market inventory. And so there's a lot of complexity inside handling a specifically Spanish speaking media outlet that big corporations like sometimes don't have the, the attention to take care of the community in the right way. So mm -hmm. we see that, for example, with Washington Post selling El Tiempo Latino, but also, for example, closing El, um, El Post that was a podcast that they had, Washington Post had in Spanish, they closed it up, uh, I think in December, and New mm -hmm. York Times also closed in his Spanish speaking operation, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, a year and a half ago. So it's something that is typical in the, in the mainstream media landscape. Well, and I feel like the Spanish speaking, Hispanic community is, is only growing larger. I mean, it's becoming much more of, of a force um, in, in culturally and, um, you know, the, that, population consumes news and is interested in their their every day so um how does that that feels like it maybe opens up opportunities for you um 100%. that you can bring you know your knowledge of the community and your commitment to the community to the fore how do, how has that sort of given you opportunities um as, as other corporations have sort of shrunk back or yeah. or pulled back i think it's a huge opportunity and for different different um yeah, in, in different ways. Uh, first, from the point of view of size of the population, you're 100% right. So Latinos are now 60 million. Um, uh, so it's, a, it's the biggest minority in the, in, the, in the nation. But for example, um, Latinos that talk in Spanish are 40, but Latinos that doesn't speak English are 16. So mm. 16 million people in the U.S., don't know how to speak English or don't feel comfortable speaking or reading in English. And, and then we, ha we have more than 40 that likes to receive news or information or talk in Spanish at least at their, at their homes. So, and it's definitely growing uh, because of immigration and because also Spanish is part of the culture of, of the Latino family that before 60, 60 to 70 years ago, um, wasn't promoted as you have to speak Spanish. But right now it seems uh, in second generation Latino as a superpower. If you if you're bilingual, you have stronger mm -hmm. skills to to go to the market and and you know find a job or or thrive. So that's one part. The other part is the they have a interesting wallet. That means that they spend and not mm -hmm. not just spend money, but also uh, are a huge part of the of the uh, GDP of this country. In fact, Latinos in the U.S., would, if, if they were a country, it would be the seventh largest country in the world from the point of view GDP. That means mm. the size of France. So uh, definitely contribute to the economy and also um, uh, it's, a, it's a great market. But I think if the you... third... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I, no, I don't want to hold it, but I was interested sure. in the diversity of the market too and sort of how you, like your, how you cover such a diverse market. Because just because everyone's Spanish-speaking doesn't mean they're all thinking the same way. But we'll get to that question. I didn't want to interrupt your thought. Yeah, the third, in fact, has to, uh, a little bit of, can be a segue for, uh, to that. And is that um, um, now 
we can be a problem. And when I say we, the Latino community, and that's why we have a lot of eyeballs and attention for that. And when I say problem, I say in a good way, because we can, 60% uh, of the votes are Latino votes, 16, mm -hmm. sorry, 16% of the votes are Latino votes. And also, for example, with the pandemic, we can see if you don't address the communication to the Latino population, then you, you affect the overall community in the US. So that mm -hmm. means that the size of the market is so big that it has a systemic uh, uh, effect to the overall population of the US. So you right. have to address the market in a in, in a good way. So what you say about uh, it was a, a a sentence that was repeated, for example, in the twenty twenty election that it was Latinos are not a monolithic demographic. Right. So that was uh, the sentence. So I have kind of a contrarian perspective in that regard. After mm -hmm. a while working in this in in this community, is that they definitely are not a monolithic, but you can predict more the interests or the issues that affect Latinos by zip code that by country of origin. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, so Latinos in Montgomery County are correct. united in the issues in front of them as opposed correct. to country that, of origin. That, okay. At least that is our uh, insight through data. We are, we have a, we put a lot of attention in analytics and data and we mm -hmm. run tests. So at least from our perspective, you can predict uh, tons more thinking about zip code and where they live and where they come from. Of course, that correlates. That mm -hmm. correlates. So you have a lot of people from one country living in the same place, but right. it's a more, uh, you, you can predict more uh, if you think about where they live than where mm -hmm. they're from or, or the different you know kinds of uh, sub uh, sub um, clusters of audience within the Latino community. So like, as you think about how you're growing on a national stage, you know, from the uh, platform of El Tiempo Latino, um, you digitally, you can reach more markets and you've done a lot of research. It, it sounds like in terms of um, knowing the issues by zip code or by area, um, mm -hmm. how does that inform your coverage? Are you, um, are you trying to, uh, kind of create bureaus? Or are you covering it all from the platform of DC? Or are you just how does how does that work for you? Sure. So um, that is a, a a really great question because it's it's some, having a, a a different language publication within a country. I think you have to think about coverage in a kind of different perspective. For example, mm -hmm. um, we put a lot of uh, effort into provide access to information to Latinos in Spanish. And what does that mean? Sometimes when you have a news outlet uh, that cover thing in, your, in the own language of the whole nation uh, or the um, uh, most popular language in the nation, then you can focus on uncovering news, scoops, mm. generating new content. But from our perspective, that is really important, but it's a percentage. We have to allocate a lot of attention into curate, translate, aggregate different sources of news in English that are not accessible for a population that prefers to consume oh, that I in see. Spanish. Okay. So that mm -hmm. means that we have to have a strong aggregation um, approach into a lot of news sources just because part of our value is reaching the communities with information that they don't have access, even though that is there. So mm -hmm. we have to allocate a lot of attention for that. The second bracket is um, how can we provide uh, information, news, and stories that are 100% Latinos and relevant for Latinos and from and to Latinos? So mm -hmm. that's that's is where we allocate tons of our journalist effort is really elevating things that affect the Latino community in particular, or at least uh, impacts them in a way that is uh, that is uh, truly relevant. So that mm -hmm. is our journalist effort. That means that we don't, or I try to not allocate a lot of uh, uh, effort from our uh, news desk into covering the same news that can cover Washington Post, New York Times, or whatever. Mm -hmm. No, we aggregate those news outlets. In fact, we are great. We have great partnerships. We don't just aggregate. We we also curate and translate. For example, Financial Times, Washington Post, The Economist, and New York Times with great partnership. I wasn't, you know, we we're really happy with those strong partnerships. So a part of our organization is translating and curating content that is not accessible for Latinos, and then focusing on coverage that is truly um, um, 
engaging and impactful for our specific community. So now what, what are some of the top issues in your, you're covering, of course, DC and you're covering kind of the, the DC suburbs. Um, what are the top issues for the, the community in those areas? What are you finding? Economy. So, the, so it's kind the, of like the same in every, everybody's no, of course, interested in the economy. Of course, sure. yeah, yeah. So, um, so one of the key things that I, that I also that I always said with, um, with, with people that um, are not recurrently engaging with the Latino population directly is that 90% of their uh, concerns are the same as uh, blue collar workers in America, in the whole mm -hmm. nation. So it's not like they have different issues or we as a community have uh, different issues. Obviously, we have something specific, sometimes from the point of view of, uh, of, of power asymmetry or obviously sometimes racism or different things that affects specifically the community or language accessibility and, uh, and, uh, and, and mm -hmm. some of those stuff. But the rest is the same things that affect the overall community, the overall uh, population in the nation. Uh, but mainly right now, uh, specific our readership and our local readership is concerned about obviously inflation. But that doesn't that word is not the word that uh, we try to use at least in our local coverage. But it's um, not getting to the end of the month. That is uh, the I don't know the, that's if, a very if that translate exactly in, in English, but it's is that so we we call it like pocket economy, mm -hmm. um, and and you know so the cost of living. Uh, the other uh, high concern is um, housing uh, affordability. That is a big concern of them uh, from the point of view of uh, of buying, but also renting. So we have mm -hmm. a big issue in our communities of, of living in a place that they feel happy and living in, in, in places they can afford. It's not an issue. So that is, and also lastly, crime and, and gun violence. But that is, I can say that this is an issue in some communities that, 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 that we see, for example, in Montgomery County or DC, for example, a fentanyl crisis is also a thing that, that we see mm -hmm. in, in a lot of our coverage or at least the interest in our coverage. But for example, gun violence is a big issue on uh, a national level for mm -hmm. the Latino community. Oh, absolutely. So it sounds like, I mean, some of those those issues, certainly affordable housing, um, some of the pocketbook issues, those, I mean, are, are certainly, uh, all of the issues you've talked about are, are definitely issues around that mainstream media is, is covering. Um, yes. And going back to some of the partnerships that you've developed, do you find, you know, do those partnerships extend to um, some to to some reporting? Are you able to localize some of the reporting that maybe the Post or the Times is is doing um, for your specific community, or yeah. are you truly translating for accessibility to to the uh, to your community markets? So it's different. So is we have different perspective. Uh, we definitely curate and translate some whole pieces without contextualizing anything. It's like you're reading mm -hmm. something from the Washington Post or from the New York Times, and we package that inside uh, editorial products uh, mainly for uh, specific audience. Those are niche products. For example, our Financial Times products is a niche product within the Spanish-speaking Latino market. Mm -hmm. um, but what we do on the, at the local level is partner with local mainly NPR stations and outlets. For example, mm -hmm. we have a great partnership with uh, uh, WMU here with, with DC. We have a, an amazing partnership in Boston with GBH and WR. In mm -hmm. fact, with GBH, in partnership with Harvard Medical School, we launch a podcast that is called Salud, that means health, mm -hmm. uh, that is broadcast in Spanish in the radio. Is the, I think it's the only uh, at least health a podcast in Spanish that NPR um, broadcasts in their radio there in, in that specifically in Massachusetts, but we also have the product here. So from the local perspective, we, for example, do, uh, do UMU or this is in this case, translate our content, our okay. coverage, and they publish it. And also we publish some of their local coverage. So from the local perspective, we prefer to have local, uh, uh, oh, absolutely. local partners. Yes. Yeah, no, it makes it makes perfect sense. And I feel like also in times, you know, where everybody is watching their resources and how they're spending their money, these partnerships are really powerful. And when you're crossing platforms, you know, not just print to digital, but, you know, 
how are you reaching your community best? And of course. certainly, you know, using radio, using podcasts, um, events and things like that can be really yeah. powerful ways to connect with the community. Are yeah. there other ways that you're sort of reaching out? Well, we're considering ourselves uh, platform agnostic media, mm. or at least that is the, the the words that we use inside the team to say, focus on the stories, focus on content, and then we figure it out what is the best way to, or the best format to, mm -hmm. to distribute that content. So uh, we are going strong in audiovisual. Uh, in fact, we launched um, a few weeks ago our first mini documentary that is called Tiroteo Made in USA, that is gunshots made in the USA, mm. uh, and is uh, uh, covering a story uh, that affects. So it's a series, but the first uh, the first chapter to say something of the series uh, is, um, is from the MS-13 gang here in Montgomery County. So mm. we do a mini documentary using an anchor that, in fact, was part of a of the story that he's covering. He was fired from a a job position, and the boss told him, "Be careful because the MS13 is looking for people exactly like you." And he oh. was a recent immigrant, so he didn't know what what was MS13. He wasn't from Central America, so he said, "Like I don't know what is this, and I want to figure it out." So we. Mm -hmm. We saw that and we changed that opportunity into cover his story of finding out who was MN13 and his path to understand why he was a potential target of that gang. And we did it uh, in a, as a documentary. Yes. What a fabulous way to get into that, um, yeah. into that topic and really localize it and, and sort of show, you know, the, that unfolding path. Yeah. It sounds like you're doing a lot of really, I love the idea of being platform agnostic. I think sometimes in news media, especially in legacy print publications, people get tangled up in, in the paper and in the print. Mm -hmm. But the power of journalism has always been the stories and, and uncovering the uh, uncovering those stories and, and making sense of it all. Um, and so Focus, your focus on the story and letting the platform kind of work itself out based on what you find, I right, think is a yes. brilliant way to navigate for sure. Yeah, so that the team and in our news desk is not thinking about what things I have to write, what things I have to film, what things I have to record. We brainstorm what things we have to cover because and it's not that we need to cover, we have to. It's, it's something that, so everything that we publish at least, not the aggregation part, that everything that we allocate journalist resources and put out out there our heart and our effort is thing that stories that we have to tell if we don't tell we feel bad with ourselves we feel we feel, we feel bad with uh with the work mm -hmm. that we do so that's kind of the filter so we're all the time looking for that uh kind of um uh, emotion inside that we definitely have to 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 be there and tell this story uh and then figure it out okay so now that we have this what is the best way to what is the first touch point from the content and format perspective? And then we have uh, another team, mainly in social media. They are really creative saying, okay, I, have, I can turn this into a reel. I can turn this into a carousel mm. in Instagram. I think this can be two stories in, in articles in the website. I think we can do some kind of infographic. So it's now how can we translate that story into 12 or or. 10 different things uh, to really serve the community where they are. That sounds like you've created this really nimble operation that um, is, is guided by what the community needs and the stories that, that you can tell uh, and share with them. So I am so looking forward to seeing what you guys are going to be doing in the next couple of years. I feel like um, you've, you've come at it with a really interesting perspective on the leadership of the organization, and I can't wait to hear more. So thank yeah. you so much for being with us today. We'll have to next time you're uh, you're when you're uh, your documentaries and things launch. We definitely want to hear about it. Um, so definitely stay in touch and thank you for coming today. Thank you, Rebecca. This was a great conversation. Thanks for listening to Five Dubs with Rebecca Snyder. Please subscribe and leave us a five-star review wherever you download your podcasts so that others can find us. What do you want to know about local journalism? Email me at rsnyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, 
at mddcpress.com. Interested in supporting our podcast and journalism? Please donate to our 501c3 Press Foundation. Find out more and see the full episode list and show notes at www.5-dubs.com.